you got your Bibles, turn with me. Uh, we're going to go to Revelation uh, chapter 3. Uh, we're, if you're new here, we are going through the book of, of Revelation. Man, I've got so many stories. I've got so much I want to tell you, um, but there's only so much time. Uh, uh, tonight, we've got this super cool thing we're doing on Sunday nights. Call, call it Worship in the Garden. They redo the whole place. The worship team's in the middle of the room. And like, it's, it's super cool. So uh, tonight that's going to be good, okay? I won't be here because I'll be at our campus up north in, uh, in Smoky Point. So we've got two campuses now. They're doing great. Uh, uh, Bjorn will be coming down and tell you guys about everything that Jesus is doing there. But I'll be there tonight uh, speaking about the letter to the church of Thyatira. So that'll be good. And, and uh, some of the Eden people are coming up there. And, all right. So, but uh, this, this, the study that we're doing today, I'll be, doing, I'll be here, believe it or not, Okay, I'll be at two places at the same time by location, okay? So I'll be on the screens preaching and I'll be in person in a place speaking at the, but the, tonight will be good because I'll be showing you some of the pictures and videos and some of the stuff that goes with the Church of Sardis. So we're looking at the letter to the Church of Sardis um, today. Um, to the map. Uh, Revel... <laughs> I know, impressive. All right, Revelation begins, okay, on the island of Patmos, which is just uh, to the east of Ephesus, out in the ocean there, okay, where the apostle, okay, John, the beloved, has been exiled because of his proclamation of Jesus, okay. He's part of a prisoner colony there. Most likely he's actually crushing rock and working, okay, part of a working camp there. Um, and so uh, it was on the Lord's Day, okay, the day of resurrection is the Early church shifted their day of, 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 of religious celebration from Sabbath, from traditional Sabbath, to Sunday, the first day of the week, so that every week, okay, would begin with the day of celebration of the resurrection of Christ. So the original intent behind Sunday is that the Christian would begin their week with the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. So that's, that's the purpose. The original purpose of Sunday is to be a day when we come together to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, okay? So let's remember that, okay? That, that today exists to res It's not a funeral, okay? Church should never feel like a funeral. It should always feel like a funeral just got ruined by resurrection power, okay? So if you're expecting a funeral today, okay, uh, I hate to rob that from you, okay, but you're not going to find death today. You're going to find life and life abundantly. Come on, somebody. Come on. All right. It's the day of resurrection, right? And John gets caught up. He goes into an ecstatic state. He goes into a vision. He hears a voice, and the voice comes from behind him. And he turns, are you ready for this? To see the voice, okay, which is awesome. I've never seen the voice before, okay? But he turns to see the voice, and when he does, he sees seven golden lampstands, all right? These are the seven churches. Seven is significant for wholeness or, or full, okay? And so what does he see? He sees the church. Very, very, very interesting. He turns to see the voice. He thinks he's going to see Jesus, and he does. But before he sees his face, he first sees his body. All right, this is a big deal. Why? Because this is the uh, first revelation, right? And, and most people, when they think about the book of Revelation, they, they, they think that revelation is um, the revelation of, of the Antichrist, okay? Okay, the book of Revelation is the revelation of the Antichrist, okay? No, okay, it's not. It's the revelation of the Christ, Jesus the Christ. The whole book is about, is about Jesus, okay? Um, all right, so then they say, all right, it's the revelation of Jesus as king seated on the throne in the throne room. Most people think what revelation, throne room, king, yeah? But the first encounter, the first catching up, uh, John hears the voice, he turns to see the voice, and he sees the church. Interesting. And in the center of the church is Christ. And, and what's he doing? He's standing. Okay, very interesting. Why? Because kings don't stand, kings sit. All right. What's he wearing? He's wearing all white and a golden girdle. So here's Jesus, and he's dressed as a priest. And he's standing. Why? Because in the temple, there was not an allowance given to chairs. Priests don't sit. Priests stand and serve. 
All right, fascinating here, okay? The, the revelation is the revelation that God has chosen his church. And we're going to read about seven churches, uh, seven churches with seven personalities, and they're not all positive, okay? They're led by, they're led by people. In fact, um, early church fathers debated because the letters are written to the angels of each church. So many have said that these were actual literal angels, but this word angel can be translated as messenger. So many of the early uh, church fathers that I have read translate messenger as overseer or pastor or bishop, seeing that these letters were written to the overseeing elder or bishop of each church. These are humans with issues. They are, these are churches with issues. Surprise, surprise, the church has some issues. Okay? And some would say, I, I can't be a part of the church because the church has issues. It's run by men. It's run by humans. Humans have issues. Okay? It's, a, it's a Roman thing. Okay? It's not. And, okay? Listen, this is the Bible. This is the written word of God. And the revelation is he reveals himself through the body. Okay? It's the body. The world will see the Christ through his body first. Okay? They'll see the body. They'll see the church. And then they'll look and they'll see the head which is Christ they'll see his face Christ is standing as priest in the midst of his church and he's standing and serving his girl his imperfect bride body the ecclesia Jesus loves the church and before you get a revelation of Christ the king you first have to get a revelation of Christ the priest who loves and serves his church you don't get to the throne room unless you first go through the church. Okay. You can't say you can't say Christ is savior and deny his body. You can't have the head without the body. Why? It's just gross. All right, so here uh, Jesus has a message to his girl, to his bride, the seven churches. And the message is given to John, and a messenger would be sent from Patmos to Ephesus here, then from e Ephesus north to Smyrna, from Smyrna north to Pergama, from Pergama down to Thyatira, and then the messenger would go south from Thyatira to Sardis. Okay, Revelation chapter 3. Let's go. If you've got your Bibles, let's stand. If you don't have your Bibles, turn with me to your apps. We're going to stand for the reading of the word uh, today. And to the angel, the messenger of the church in Sardis, write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. The reputation of being alive, but you are dead wake up okay everyone just say that with me wake up let's do it again one two three wake up and one more time one two three wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God remember then what you received and heard uh, keep it read that with me keep it and repent very good. If you will not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers, who overcomes, okay, will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The reading of the word. Let's pray. Father, I ask, Lord, that we would have humility of heart to hear what your Spirit is saying to us, your church, your girl, your bride. Father, I pray that we would have the humility and the honesty to turn away from everything that is dead and to turn towards you who is very alive. Father, I thank you for your grace. You have given us the time to be awakened. And Father, I ask that your spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of awakening and revival would be in our midst, would awaken us 
from slumber in this hour. Awaken your girl. Awaken your church. Awaken the church in Seattle. Let her, let her arise and shine and let the glory of the Lord arise within your church in this region, in this nation, in this hour. Oh God, we love you. We serve you and we thank you for loving and serving us. We praise your glorious name in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. All right. First of all, let me just say this. Uh, Christianity was never meant to trend within the culture. Okay? Christianity was never meant to be cool, right? Uh, in fact, Christianity has always been the counterculture. It has always contrasted radically from the norms of any sort of culture in any sort of nation, okay? Christianity has never naturally just fit in, okay? Uh, in fact, you could almost say that Christianity isn't just countercultural, it's almost anti-cultural, okay? And what does this mean? It means that as long as the church is trying to fit in in the culture, as long as we think, okay, that we can go into the culture, be just like the culture, speak like the culture, live like the culture, and think that in looking exactly like the culture, that they're going to come and be a part of the glorious church of Jesus Christ, we are deceived and we are wasting our time. Here's what happens. A lot of people say, what are you doing? Okay, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to be in the culture and I'm going to live with the people and I'm going to speak the language and I'm going to live out their customs and I am going to change them, okay? I'm going to influence them, okay? And then all of a sudden, over time, we realized, wow, we are the ones that are being influenced, not the culture, okay? I, I, sometimes I wonder, we look at like the church and some of our methods, even in Seattle, right? And we look at the different... Um, uh, methodologies and the different fads that have taken place uh, within within the church, okay? And uh, to the degree that here you have uh, people that are going into the culture and doing the things of the culture. And for a while there, it was kind of like, hey, what do you do, you know? Well, I'm a missionary to Seattle. What does that look like? Well, I go to the bar um, five nights a week and drink beer, okay? Okay, Th that's what you do? Yeah, that's what I, that, that's my job, okay? I go, I go to the bar. How's that your job? Well, I got supporters from all over the world, okay? And it's called relational <laughs> evangelism, okay? And so, uh, and, and, all right, so, and how's that going for you? Well, I know all the guys at the bar. Okay, cool. How many guys at the bar? No, Jesus. True missions does not mean that you know people. True missions mean that people know Jesus because of you. What's the strategy? We're going to just get to know people. We're going we're gonna to be like them, okay? And in doing so, <laughs> we're going to change them, okay? We're going to change the culture. Point being is you ain't going to change nothing. We were never called to change the culture. You can't change a culture. Uh, you can't change your DNA, okay? You can't change your spouse's DNA. How many of you have ever tried to change someone? Hey, let's ask an easy question. How many of you have ever tried to change yourself? The point being is this. We are not to use our time, energy, and resources to change the culture. We are to use our time, our energy, our resources, and our passions to bring into the earth a counterculture, to bring into the church a high and better culture. We are not called into the darkness to become like the darkness, to speak like the darkness, and to change the darkness. No, we are called to be the light of heaven and to bring heaven to earth. Let your kingdom come. Let your so we are not to change the earth so it looks like heaven. We are to bring heaven to earth. We don't change culture. We create new culture, a higher culture, a glorious culture. We don't have to act like them. We act like him. We don't have to sound like them. We sound like him. Jesus, right? How about Jesus, right? Think about Jesus. <laughs> you know, Jesus. 
there's a, there's a story, and Jesus is, is with Pilate. Okay, Pilate's a pretty big deal. He's, a, he's what they call an influencer, right? <laughs> Pilate had a lot of, he had like 25 million followers on Instagram. He had like, more than that, he had like 100 million followers, right? And everybody's like, Jesus, wow, Jesus is going to be with Pilate. Wow, this is incredible. What's Jesus going to, Jesus is in the quarters of Pilate. Like he's behind the scenes. Like all the haters, they're in the mob, okay? They're in the public, Okay, but Jesus, Jesus is with, with one of the most influential men. He's with, he's with Pilate, right? Imagine if that happened today. Imagine, you know, <laughs> Darren, did you hear the news? What? Darren is going to Washington, D.C. Ooh, wow, Darren's going to Washington. Yeah, and he's not going to be out on the grass with everybody else. No, Darren's going to be in the Oval Office. Ooh, you know, wow. Okay, it is an office that's an oval, okay. <sighs> He's going to be in there. He's going to be with Biden, okay. And, and he's going to be with, you know, you know wow, this is going to be, this is, you know, Darren, he's going to influence the culture. He's going to, you know, you think about these, these, you know, these times, okay. Powerful people, I, I'm going to get to meet a powerful, you know, person on, you know, this is a, finally Jesus is with Pilate. This is when it's all going to go ha, go down. This is when uh, Rome is going to change. Okay, this is when Rome is going to become a Christian nation. Which, by the way, it did become a Christian nation. Turned out to be one of the worst things for our faith. Okay, where our faith was subverted and perverted and turned into something radically different than what Jesus looked like. We'll get into stuff in the Revelation. God doesn't think too highly of our political systems. So here is Jesus. He's with Pilate. And Pilate goes, I get you, man. I'm like you. That's what Pilate actually sound like. I watch his Discovery Channel. They've got audio <laughs> clips. Audio clips of raptors, swimming dinosaurs. And Pilate, he goes, I get you, man. You're, you're a king. I, like you, am also a king. Here we are. We're in my quarters. We're hanging. Just tell me out of your own mouth. Tell me that you're a king. Right? And Pilate's trying to be cool. He's trying to be nonchalant. He's having this conversation. Here isn't, guys, are you tracking with me? Think of Je Jesus multiplied um, fishes and bread. He walked on water. He walked through walls. Just think of what he could have done. He could have easily, I, I think he could have easily won Pilate over. I think he could have made some friends and influenced some people. By the way, that's the purpose of the church. We are to make friends and influence people. Wrong. That's Dale Carnegie. And Dale Carnegie is nothing like Jesus. Because when you read about Jesus, he didn't care much about making friends and influencing people. In fact, Jesus had two different parties that wanted to kill him. The political party and the religious party. He had two both sides of the coin wanted him dead. Okay? How do you know that you look like Jesus? You're not very popular. And everybody wants you dead. Okay? When everybody loves you, okay, you might be in danger of being dead. And what's even more dangerous is like Sardis, is being dead and not knowing it. And here's, here's Jesus, and he's a pilot. And, and Jesus, this is an opportunity to influence him, right? To change, to change him. And, and, and Pilate's saying, hey, just, just come on, let's, let's hang. <laughs> come on, man, let's hang, right? And, and then uh, just say you're, 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 you're king. We're the same thing. And, and, and Jesus basically just looks at him and says, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be friends. Jesus basically just looks at him and says, uh, hey, let's, let's not pretend for a second like we're a part of the same system. Let's not pretend for a second like we're peers. Jesus looks at Pilate and says, yeah, yeah, what you think looks like power. 
where you've worked your whole entire, the, the, the manipulation, the games that you have played to step into what you think is power. I am not impressed by what you call power. In fact, the little bit of power that you've been given has been given to you from my father. So I'm sorry. No, we're, we're not going to be friends. And Pilate goes, well, I don't know what to do with you then. And he throws him out to the people and says, do with him as you please. Here we have the church, and Jesus writes the letter uh, to Sardis. And he writes a letter to this church, and he doesn't address their persecution. The reason why he doesn't address their persecution, are you ready for this? The Christians in Sardis weren't persecuted. Why? Because they all just got along. Guess what? When, when Jesus writes the letter to Sardis, he doesn't address their temptation. He doesn't say, I know that the enemy is working on you. I know that the enemy is tempting. When Jesus writes the letter to Sardis, okay, he doesn't say, this I have against you. You're tolerating that false prophetess Jezebel. He doesn't say, it. check it out. Here's the church of Sardis, okay? There's no persecution there's no temptation. Here's a church that the devil is not attacking. He's completely leaving them alone. How is that? Because the devil doesn't attack things that are dead. If you are dead, the devil's not going to waste his energy on you. And he's not going to waste his arrows on you. Here was a church, okay, that had just lost, that had completely compromised everything. Here was a church that was no different than any other religion. In fact, the sin against Sardis is that the Christians all had bumper stickers that said, coexist. Can I, listen, listen, this isn't just a letter to the church of Sardis. This is a prophetic letter to the church of Seattle. This is a, this is a wake up call to the church of Seattle. We are not called to fit in. We are not called to make friends. We are called to make disciples of nations. We are called to make converts, converting people from death to life, from depression to joy, okay? From being orphans to being sons and daughters, and none of those changes take place when you're just trying to fit in. None of those changes take place when you care about what people think about you. Can I tell you something? Jesus did not care about what anybody thought about him except his father. I, was, uh, I used to be a part of a city uh, thing, and I was the chairman of, of, this, of this deal, and it was great. The Lord uh, got to do some stuff, okay? And it was good, okay? And, um, and I was encouraged by the city to be a part of this um, association of, of churches, okay? Because uh, these churches were making a real difference in the city. And this is where it's like a little bit unfortunate. These churches were doing really good things, okay? And, um, uh, and uh, maybe it was because they had no value for the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it seemed like the churches that were making the greatest good in the city, working with the poor, the homeless, opening up their churches, okay, to the homeless, um, what all these guys had in common was there was no active participation with the Holy Spirit. And this is what I love about what the Lord is doing on the earth. Churches like Eden, okay, and, and we're making these declarations that we care about the cause for the poor, that righteousness is the Father's business. It's the business of the church and not the, I love what God is doing here. Why? Because we're casting out demons, we're leading people to Jesus, but we're also feeding the poor. But my friends, that's a new behavior. So I was part of this uh, group, okay, and we're at, I'm at the table, okay, and I realized, wow, there's like nobody here. There's a lot of pastors here, but there's nobody here that's really um, orthodox, okay? In fact, the pastor sitting to my right uh, was uh, Elder Howard, okay, of the, of the Mormon church. And he's just as nervous sitting next to me as I am <laughs> you know, of, of him and... And then, um, and then the, the leader of, 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 the, of, the, of the churches um, gets up, okay, 
and he is a, he's a pastor, okay? Uh, he's also, he's also um, a homosexual, okay? And he gets up and he tells the whole group of, of pastors, he says, I was with, okay, I was with uh, the, the Muslims last week and we, we took a group of pastors into the mosque and we got a tour of the, of the mosque. And let me just tell you, um, these brothers are incredible. The things that we learned about our Muslim brothers. In fact, we're going to do this again. We want to open this up to all the pastors in our city that we would go uh, into the mosque and, and get this tour uh, because our Muslim brothers uh, have so much to teach us um, and, to, and to offer us, okay? And, 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 and so just so you know, um, I, I didn't make it back to that, to that um, okay? Because the idea is, let's get religious leaders from all over the city and let's get them all around the same table. And after all, all ways go to heaven. After way, all, all gods lead to the same divine essence. God is a person. God is a divine energy. God is a principle, okay? So what, what's right for you is right for you. And, 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 and what is this? This is Sardis, okay? This is Seattle, okay? This is a, a spiritual uh, agenda uh, within our nation, right? And, and the problem with this is the Bible, okay? So here in Eden, we are really big on the Bible. And that means whether I'm, it's not a Darren thing, it's an Eden thing. This is the church thing. And that means that if I'm not here, no matter who's at the pulpit or bistro table, no matter who's here, um, the first thing they do is they're going to open their Bible. And we're not going to say we do this to make it legal. No, we do this because God's word is a lamp unto our feet. The Bible, listen, is not a joke for us, okay? The Bible's not an inconvenience for us. It is the living, active Word of God, and because of His Word, okay, because of the Scriptures, okay, we don't, we don't put an expiration date on ourselves and on our families, okay? The Bible's timeless, and if you want to be timeless, subscribe, eat the Bible. I don't care what kind of revelation you have if you're not eating the Word of God, we eat the word and then we bring forth revelation. Okay? So if I hear your revelation, but it's not grounded in the word, okay, then you can just, you can just chew your own cud. Because I don't need that crud. We keep it centered in Christ. Okay? We keep it scriptural. And the scriptures say Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And that means this. It means that we don't get to do what's true for you is true for me. My, this is my truth. Okay? This is your truth. These are not words that, that the Christian uses. These are not words that you should use uh, from this point forward. Why? That's Sardis vocabulary. What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me? No, 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 no. Jesus is the only way to the Father, and any spiritual realm outside of Christ cannot be trusted because you've accessed it through a, a, an imposter shepherd. And any time you enter a sheep gate through an imposter shepherd, it will only lead you into information that leads to deception. Only in Christ can you be assured that you're safe. It's, it's fascinating. Um, uh, we were in the streets this last week and I uh, brought Abigail uh, with me and we're chatting with a, a young man and he's, uh, he works in a hospital. He works in a haunted hospital, okay? And um, this, is, this is for real. Uh, this hospital uh, has, a, has training, just like with any job onboarding, but part of their onboarding is uh, and what to do if you encounter the girl in the red dress or the man with the top hat. How would you like to work there, you know? If you ever encounter the girl in the red dress, don't engage her. Why? She's known to get violent. Guys, we're, we're not talking about a, a literal girl. We're talking about a, a ghost or what it actually is, is a demon, okay? So this poor guy works at a hospital, okay, where it used to have it in the, uh, a crematory in the basement. And, and now the, 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 so he works the night shift, okay? And, um, and, and so we're, we filmed this whole thing and we're talking with him. I said, have you ever seen this girl? He says, yes. He goes, I, I hear the footsteps. He says, he goes, he goes you want to see pictures? <laughs> you <know>. Yes. <laughs> you know. So he's got his phone out and he's showing me these, these pictures. And, and, um, 
And then, so it was, it was interesting. I, you know, we've talked with a lot of people over the last few weeks about the paranormal and the supernatural. Believe it or not, we have not chatted with one person that, that, that hasn't had supernatural encounters. Every person we've talked to has had wild, unexplainable supernatural encounters. Why would that be? Because every human is supernatural because they're created in the image and likeness of God. Eternity is in the hearts of man and it's summoning them towards the Savior. Just, I, I know, I know, you know, you just nod your head and say, okay. <laughs> you say, interesting, Pastor, right. So then I asked the guy, I said to him, well, then what about your childhood? Because, you, you, you know, and uh, I said, what, tell me about your childhood. He goes, my childhood was fine. I never, nothing was weird in my childhood. I said, well, that's interesting. He goes, well, I was raised in a Christian home. He goes, and, and, uh, he goes, and I still believe in God. I said, well, well, then you have the authority to rebuke that thing. He goes, well, I haven't tried that yet. We were told, and that's when he told me, we were told not to, not to engage it because the girl gets violent. Anyways, so we're going to find that hospital and, and go. Because, by the way, we're kind of like the real-life Ghostbusters here. <laughs> right? Like, who are you going to call? Eden! The super soakers with holy water. Let's go. Y'all should do that. Have you ever done that? Prayed for water and because you're a priest. Anyways, that'll be a different, a different, yeah. Yeah. Think about this for a second. Every child that's raised in a, in a, in a Christian home, they're raised in an environment that's not spiritually vulnerable. But if you're raised in a home where, 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 where mom and dad are not in Christ, you got these children, they're vulnerable and open because there's no veils of unbelief, right? Every home should be a Christian home. Every home, every mommy and daddy should be a Christian mommy and daddy. Why? Because of the security and safety of the children in the home, just to begin with, okay? All right. So um, the problem, okay? The problem isn't that you're dead. The problem, Jesus says, is that you're dead and you don't know it. And you need to wake up. And this is what he says. There's a few of you. There's a remnant in Sardis. There's a few of you and your, your garments haven't been soiled. He goes, I've given you time. I've given you time to, to wake up and to repent. Right? This word repent is interesting, okay? This word repent doesn't mean, you know, to, you know, to, to run to the altar and, and tear your shirt open and start screaming on the top of your lungs, Okay? At the end of this message, you know, keyboardist, get up here. All right, okay, here we go. On count of three, I'm going to have you scream your brains out, okay? And if you scream loud enough, God will forgive you, okay? And, then, you know, and I get my phone ready because I'm going to get all these people screaming their brains out, and then I'll, I'll, I'll video it and put it on Instagram and call it Revival. On count of three, if you don't scream, God can't. Okay, repentance. All right, listen, if you're a dude and you want to scream, Okay, but if you're a woman, just, you know, keep this. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> you know. Repentance, okay, isn't about what happens here on Sunday. Repentance is about the freedom and liberty, the clarity that you have on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. And what does that mean? It means that the areas of your heart that are dead, the areas of your life that you're putting makeup on, okay, things that are dead stink, they're, they're pale, and they require cover-up. Yeah? The things in your life that you're trying to cover up, the things in your life that you're trying to make pretty, trying to make right. This is what Jesus says. If you repent, what does that mean? If you're willing to turn, repentance just means to turn. If you're willing to turn away from, from those behaviors, those, those beliefs, um, those feelings that aren't anchored in God's word, if you're willing to turn away from these ideas, if you're willing to turn away from your excuses, right, your, your justification, um, you know, we know a lot about justification. How many of you have ever sinned? <laughs> How many of you are lying? All right. You know, th there's, a, there's, there's somebody in the room and they're just like, not, not me. <laughs> <You know. laughs> not going to do it, right? God bless you, right? The one, you know. um, all right, so uh, how many of you have ever, like, sinned and you're like a Christian and you knew that you shouldn't sin? And like, how many of you ever like, you were a Christian and you like, you did a big, you did a biggie, okay? You did a big sin. Like, uh, 
You don't have to raise your hand. Okay, just, um, but you did like, how many of you, like, you were a Christian, you knew better, but you did like a, a bad sin. Okay. <laughs> You're like, how did this guy get his license? All right. Um, <laughs> who ordained this guy? Like, you did a bad, you know, here's the deal. When you are <laughs> trying to follow Christ, right, and you're about to, you're about to compromise, you're about to do a bad sin, th there, there's stuff that you start to tell yourself. Okay? You start to make a legal case as if you're going before the judge in your own heart, you know, saying, well, you know, and, I, you know, and we, we start to plead our case uh, to our, you know, forget you know, the church never, you know, that's what it sounds, you know, have you ever been there? You know, it's always the church too. It's always, you know, the church, right? You know, and, you know, and because the church is, is that way, I get to sin. Hallelujah. I, you know. All right, so, um, yeah. Right, what does repentance mean? It means um, that you're going to stop pleading your case. It means you're going to stop with the excuses. It means you no more, you don't get to blame the church anymore. It means you don't get to blame your dad anymore. It means you don't get to blame your mom anymore. Okay, it means you don't get to blame your pastor anymore. Okay, repentance means um, humility, okay, and the responsibility just to be like all, all of that stuff. I'm, I'm done, I'm like, I'm done with it. And I'm gonna leave it all here, why? Because now I'm turning to Jesus and he won't allow any of it. You know that Jesus is kind of like an all or nothing savior? He doesn't see himself as an add-on, okay? He's not, he's not willing to bargain with you and you know, Jesus isn't like, hey, you know, give me Sunday and I'll give you Monday to Wednesday and we can hang out a little on Thursday, you know? No, 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 Jesus is like, it's all or, or nothing. Right? This, is, and this is what Jesus tells the church in Sardis. This is what Jesus is telling, telling you and I uh, today. I've given you time. Okay? I've given you time. And th this is, this is, but, this is, but if you don't, okay? Now follow me here. He goes, if you don't repent, he says, I'm going to come. I'm going to come. But when I come, I'm not coming as a friend. The language here is really interesting. When he says, I'm going to come as a thief in the unknown hour, Okay, this isn't talking about bad 80s rapture movies. I've been through like 100 sozos and I'm still traumatized from that guillotine in that movie. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Children of the 80s, okay. No, when he says I'm, I'm going to come as a thief, okay, the early church would have understood this language. This is uh, the early uh, Jewish people, okay, within their story, they've, they've got the understanding of when, when Babylon would come in and how, what invasion, look, guys, this is invasion uh, uh, dialogue here, okay? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't the, uh, 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 coming from, a, he says, if you don't uh, repent, I'm coming, and when I come, I'm not coming as your friend, I'm coming as your foe. I'm coming um, uh, not as your ally. I'm coming a, a, as a conqueror. I'm coming as a judge. And he goes, and the reason why I'm coming is because I will not lose my church. I will not. See, a lot of people in, in, in Revelation, uh, they, you know, they, they really get off on the whole angry God, um, meany God. And, and, you, and you hear things like, America, God has tried his kindness with you and his kindness failed. And now he's taking off his kindness hat and he's putting on his severity hat. Behold the judgment of God. <laughs> Okay, listen, listen. God never takes off his love hat to put on his wrath hat. His severity flows from his goodness, from his love. And because God so loves Sardis, he assures them there will be justice because there will be shalom. And the only way there will be peace, and the only way there will be restoration is if God in his love comes and confronts this death that's trying to infest the church. Do you see that? The book of Revelation is, yes, it's the fiery, jealous love of God the Father. And he says, I've given you time to repent. But if you're not willing to turn from this, I am not willing to allow this to cost me my church, to cost me my girl. And he says, I am coming. And when I come, I am not coming to the unrepentant as a friend. I'm coming as a foe. He says, and I am coming. When I come, it'll be when you least expect it. 
He says, but there are those of you, he says, and, and, and you haven't soiled your garments yet, and you still love me. And he says, and for you, he says, I've written your name in the Lamb's book of life. And this is what he says, and for you, I will not be ashamed to testify of you before my Father. Do you see, this is a church that received this letter, and, and for those who read this letter, that was the mercy of God at work. You received this letter. You came to church this morning. You heard this message. You read this message. And this is not God saying, I hate you. I'm ashamed of you. This is God saying, America, I love you. Seattle, I love you. But this thing I have against you, you sold out. You tried to fit in. You, you went into Babylon thinking I was going to, to Christianize Babylon. That was never the plan. I called you into the darkness, but I didn't want to lose you to the darkness. I commanded you to be light in the midst of darkness, and yet you lost your light. You're dead, and you don't know it. Be awakened. And he said, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Seattle, wake up. Church, wake up. This is written to believers. Wake up. Just say it with me right now. Wake up. You can declare it over yourself. Wake up. You can declare it over your marriage. Wake up. You can declare it over your soul. Wake up. You can declare it over the church. Wake up. You can declare it over our country. Wake up. We are in a time of mercy, in an in a, in a age where we can repent, in a time when we can be honest, okay, without being shamed. This is glorious and this is good, but there is urgency on this text and there is urgency in the days in which we are living. How do you know if you're dead? There's no love. There's no love. Right? How do you know if you're dead? There's no works. There's no miracles. How do you know if you're dead? There's no revelation. There's no, God spoke to me today. God, think about this for a second. God, the creator of the universe, spoke to you? Like you're telling me, Ellie, that the same God that, put, that created all things in, that God, God spoke to you. And Ellie's like, yeah. How do you know if you're dead? You're not hearing anything. You're not seeing anything. And the message to the church is, he who has an ear, do you hear me now? This is what God's saying, do you hear me now? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. How do you know if you're dead? You're not persevering. You're not standing. How do you know if you're dead? There's no battle readiness in you. There's no fight in you. You're just going with the flow, just doing the deal, right? Make it to church once a month, right? Vote for Trump, right? When it's all said and done, maybe we'll see you in heaven, right? For a lot of people, making it to heaven is the win. My friend, that's not the win. Heaven on earth is the win. How does heaven come to earth? We repent of the hell that we've been tolerating and engaging with. We get it out of our hearts. We get it out of our souls. We get that desire for hellish things out of our minds. We disassociate with the things of hell and we begin to engage Jesus the Christ, the holy and anointed one, his realm, his world, it, and, it, and the reality that heaven, that Jesus, he is inside of us, that we are priests on the earth standing and serving and when we speak, our words are anointed. It's as if the words of Christ are coming off our lips. And when we lay hands on people, it is no different as if Jesus himself was laying hands on people. And that when you heal the sick, it's no different than Jesus himself healing the sick. And when you cast out devils, it's no different than Jesus himself casting out demons. Why? We are the agency by which God has employed to reveal his headship. They'll see you and then they'll see him. They'll see your works and then they'll see the Father. They will see you and they'll say, tell me more about Jesus. They'll say you and they'll say, tell me your story. He said, I'm actually called to ministry. I attend Eden. And then the dude brought his whole family to, to church. Isn't that awesome? Let me just prophesy. We're coming into the days, okay, when, when, when unbelieving men start bringing their families to church. Yeah. 
That's why he's created you. He has created you to reveal him, to be fruitful and to multiply and then to take dominion. I got, I got in trouble for saying this at, at a church and you know, I, I, I didn't know, I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean, you know, I was just trying to make friends and get along with everybody. <laughs> but I said, you know, and I stole this from Pastor Greg. All my best stuff comes from Pastor Greg, uh, who's not here because he, he received the offering and he left. <laughs> Who does that? So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All, all my best stuff does come from Pastor Greg. And, and Greg said to me one day, he goes, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that we were created to worship? He says, in the Bible, it says that we were created to be fruitful and to multiply and to take dominion. We're created for partnership. Anyways, so I stole that because I never give great credit. I don't know why I did today. But this is, um, <laughs> I was at a church and I said, did you know that you weren't created uh, to simply worship? We love to worship, okay? We love to worship. It's amazing. But we were created to be fruitful and to multiply, right, and to take dominion and to say, yes, this is our inheritance. This world isn't the problem. This world is the prize. And all of a sudden, you begin to see this great battle to make everything so internal, to keep the mirror ever before us, so that our mission is always ourselves. So we always got more self-work to do, right? And, and we're never quite good enough. We're never quite holy enough, okay? And all of a sudden, in this place, we lose our battle readiness, okay? And in this place, um, uh, uh, our, our spirituality, okay? Our spirituality uh, uh, it, uh, always just terminates on, our, on ourselves, right? But if you want to, if you want to be alive this morning, if you want to see God show up in power, if you want to see miracles, if you want to see uh, deliverance, okay, then put the mirror down, okay? Turn the, turn the selfie camera off and see Jesus and see this world that he loves so much and then say, I'm not going to fear this world. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this to get votes. I'm not going to try to change this world. This world, it belongs to me. It belongs to the sons and daughters of God. I've got an agenda. I've got an you know, it bugs me when people say, we don't have an agenda. Have you ever been to a meeting without an agenda? Nothing happens. Everybody sits in a room and talk, talks to Mother God. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've got an agenda, and it's to make disciples. It's, it, it's to see cities and nations fall in love with Jesus. You've got an agenda. You've got a testimony. You've got authority. You've lived through some stuff. You, nobody else has your, you know, so you, you could be like, hey, I'm the only person in this room that's been divorced 18 times, right? <laughs> I'm, if God can use me, ha, 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 God loves, religion says you're disqualified. I, I'm not telling you to do it again, okay? Nobody else has your, you've got authority. You've been called. You've been stinking saved. You're not that old man anymore. You're not that old woman anymore. You've got Christ Jesus, the hope of glory inside of you. So go ahead and offend some people with the good news. Go ahead and tell the truth in love. Go ahead and start to show up. Go ahead and pray for some sick people. Here's the thing. If the outcome isn't as you desired, at least they know that they are loved. Pastor Bjorn up in Eden North, I'm always telling him, go ahead and get arrested. I'll bail you out. Let's rock the boat. Let's cause some ripples. We're not here to make friends and influence people. Okay, we're not here to, to hang out with popular people. We're not here to, you know, Darren comes walking in the room with some celebrity. I, I don't need that, okay? You don't need that. There's a lot of nobodies that are suffering and suicidal that don't know Jesus, okay? We're not here to win the influencers. Oh, and, and we're not going to kiss the ring because of what it's going to mean for our thing. We will not kiss the ring. We will not bow to Caesar. Caesar's not Lord. Trump is not Lord. Oh yeah. Jesus is Lord. Get your eyes onto Jesus. Get, the political system will always let you down. Well, the religious system will always let you down. Jesus will not let you down. And a church who knows who she is will begin to bring the true culture, the heavenly nation to this nation. Praise God. You ambassadors, you, you ambassadors of reconciliation, 
Okay, you've got authority. You've got opportunity. The devil is a liar. You're not disqualified. You're qualified. You're ordained. You're called because of the blood of the Lamb that is spoken for you. You are radically, infinitely, beautifully loved by God. Now let's live for Him. Let's stand together. Can we just, uh, just hold out our, our hands? Close, close your eyes uh, so that I disappear, the room disappears. And let's just pray together. Let's just say, Holy Spirit, give us the grace. Give us the humility to be able to see the parts of our heart that are dead, the fruitless branches. We don't want to hang ornaments on dead branches. Now, King Jesus, bring your pruning shears and cut off every dead branch that I may bear more fruit. It says in his word, he cuts off every dead branch. And you know what he does? He throws them in the fire. You want to know why? Because once they go in the fire, you can't duct tape them back to the tree. How many of you have ever had a branch removed and then you tried to get it back? You tried to put it back on. Are you willing to give them every dead branch that bears no fruit? Let them prune it. Let them cut it off. Let them throw it in the fire. Is that good? Just say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to cut off? I trust you. I love you. I thank you for loving me. Oh, I surrender my life. Oh, I surrender my soul. Oh, I surrender my body. Oh, I surrender you because I trust you. Oh, wake us up, Holy Spirit. Wake us up. Wake us up. Shake us up. Wake us up. Oh, let your fire come. Let your fire burn. Everything that is not of you, come and burn. Come and burn. Come and burn. I see the, I see the Lord coming and, and burning stuff. And, and I see even parts of your body that are going to become operational going, again. And, I, and I, I feel like there are, uh, there are people here and you've got parts of your body that are not working like they should. Okay? If that's you, just lift up your hands real high. You got things that are not operating the way that they should. Okay? You know, don't lift your hands so I can see. My eyes are shut. But just lift up your hand by faith right now and just declare with me right now, Jesus, you created my body to be operational. So now I invite your presence. Wow. Wow. I invite your power right now to come and restore my body back into working order. And Lord, I pray this would be a prophetic sign that you're coming into your church to restore your church back to its operation and back to working order. I pray that Eden would be operational. Hallelujah. 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 Prophesy with me. We welcome the power of God right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yep, yep, yep. All chronic inflammation in people's bodies. I say chronic inflammation. You are not of the Holy Spirit. Nope, 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 nope. I say fire on you right now in Jesus' name. All chronic inflammation right now on people's legs, on people's joints, on people's hips right now. Loose right now in Jesus' name. Loose right now, right now, right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, blood stuff. Um, uh, thank you, Lord. The digestive stuff. Your body is not digesting food. It's not processing food. Somebody here, your body doesn't have the ability to pull the nutrients out of food. So you're not getting the nutrients that you need out of the food. I just declare the fire of God right now on your stomach, on your organs, on the acids in your stomach right now. I just... I'm sure there's a name for it. <laughs> Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the fire of God. You're going to begin to digest your food. You're going to begin to pull nutrients out of the food. Hallelujah. 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 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I, I even declare there's a, there's a mother here and you haven't heard from your son in quite some time. And there's been, uh, there's been a, 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 a bridge that was burnt and, um, and something happened. And, uh, and your son said he would never talk to you again. And I just, I, just, I just see the Lord coming in His grace. And the Lord says, even by night, I've been working to rebuild that bridge. He says, it's not something that you have done. The Lord says your relationship with your son is very important to Him. And I see, even as you sleep, the Lord says, I've been working to rebuild that bridge so that you can go to your son and he will listen to you. And the Lord says, I'm going to bring reconciliation between the heart of this mother and the heart of her son. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. If you got your communion elements, let's take them out here. Uh, it's written that on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body. Uh, that is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. So this morning, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who is not dead, but very, very alive. And we engage with him this morning. We, re we engage with his resurrected body, and we pull the finished work of the cross and that resurrection power into our bodies right now. Not with a church tradition, but with a supernatural activation. We engage with the body of Christ. Let's partake of his body together this morning. And in the same way, he took the cup after dinner and he blessed it and said, this is my blood that was shed for you. Take and drink. He said, and do this often. For as often as you do, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this morning as we drink of his blood, as we bring it into our bodies, Father, I thank you for the light of your love that explodes inside of us. Lord, it transforms us and breaks every single generational curse going all the way back to Adam. So we engage with the blood of the Lamb this morning. Again, not from a place of tradition, but from a supernatural activation knowing that we will be radically changed as a result. Let's participate and receive the cup together this morning. Now let's take a quick second to give thanks to the Lord because He is good and His steadfast love endures forever and ever. Can our prayer ministry team come? If you need prayer this morning, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to stand with you. Um, otherwise, we will be back uh, tonight. You're welcome to see us up at Eden North tonight. Uh, otherwise, have a powerful week. Visitors, I'll see you in the hallway. God bless you.